What, what's a better way to start the day than to have me in, <laughs> in your face at 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday? Okay. Um, 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 all right, let's get started. Because I think some of you have classes after this one. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Okay. As most of you know, I had a, um, an interest in this case, Reyes versus Komelec, as soon as it came out, and I couldn't help talking about it in some of our classes. I think it has um, very significant implications on the rule of law in the Philippines. Now, this is a, uh, uh, a, the College of Law, and this chair is supposed to be a centennial chair in law, but I'm never one to restrict uh, my analysis or my discussion on legal matters, so we're going to apply you know, other, other perspectives in, in the analysis of this uh, case. And it's a big one that should be resolved correctly, I think, if this is going to, uh, if it's, if it's going to, uh, it has to because we have to believe the legal system works. This is a very serious challenge to the very concept, I think, of rule of law as we know it. So, the cast of characters. <laughs> Reina Reyes um, is the representative of, Mar oh, I shouldn't say, thinks she is the representative of Marin Duque. And that photo is her press conference where she's trying to convince everyone that she is a Filipino citizen. Those are the documents um, uh, that she relies on. Lord Alan Velasco, um, uh, it's the proclaimed winner, according to the Comelec and the Supreme Court. Okay. That's, it's the best, sh best shot I could find in the internet. So, and it's not, you know, to make fun of him. So that's the, um, that's the, 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 the cast, right? The, the case, I think we have to talk about it first, was decided June um, this year. And what makes it interesting for me is the kind of response that it got. And it's not just in the academe, it's out in the press, stuff like this. Well, the Congress, as far as I can recall for the first time, refused to recognize a decision of the Supreme Court. And they, instead of following the Supreme Court, decided to recognize Reyes as a member of Congress. Um, and, and there is open, they are openly making fun of and criticizing the decision of the Supreme Court calling it names, not the Supreme Court itself, but the decision, according to member, or the members of Congress, um, later we'll get to it, they have very unflattering things to say about the decision. And of course, um, in the latest twist, apparently even Reyes has said she's going to initiate an impeachment proceeding against Justice Velasco, who incidentally, uh, did not participate in, in the decision. So you got this kind of a reaction and then there's no way we cannot talk about uh, a case like this. So what happened in that case? Um, well, basically, the qualifications of the Hina Reyes were being questioned on the ground that of material misrepresentations, right? You know, you can cancel a certificate of candidacy based on these misrepresentations uh, for our purposes, um, you know, it's because uh, she's an American citizen and you know you have to be a natural born Filipino to run for Congress. The first division said she is an American citizen and that she failed to follow the requirements of this relatively new law on reacquiring Filipino citizenship. That is RA 9225 very recent, and then according to that law, she must first take an oath of allegiance to the Republic of the Philippines, and then make a personal and sworn renunciation of her American citizenship before any public officer authorized to administer an oath. Okay? Reyes filed a motion for recon, and uh, she says she's a natural born Filipino citizen, and then she has not lost her status simply by obtaining and using an American passport. She said that her marriage to an American citizen not only resulted, rather, only resulted into a dual citizenship, 
Therefore, she doesn't have to reacquire Filipino citizenship under the Public Act 9225. That's basically her story. And uh, in any case, she attached other evidence supporting her claim of uh, uh, her Filipino citizenship, and etc., etc. And the last one she says, as to her alleged lack of one year of residency, uh, she has never become a naturalized citizen. She never lost her domicile of origin, which is, of course, in Manimduque. These things should sound familiar to you, right? Should be haunting. And Bank said, denied the motion for recon filed by Reyes. So if you lost, um, I, here's the interesting part. Right after that, on May 18, she was proclaimed the winner. And then on June 5, the Yan Bank issued a certificate of finality declaring that its May 14 decision, the one up there on top, uh, had become final and executory. And then on the same day, she takes her oath before Speaker Belmonte. But you can't not have a problem if this is what you're doing. They're all, they're all in a hurry here. So Reyes goes to the Supreme Court and basically raises four issues. On the first one, uh, on the jurisdiction of the COMELEC, because she has been proclaimed, her argument is that it is now the House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal that has jurisdiction over her case. On the second issue, COMELEC committed abuse of discretion because it admitted Tan's alleged new evidence, which, by the way, is a, an online article showing that Reyes is uh, an American citizen. So there's a legal argument there. Is that kind of you know, is that admissible uh, before the COMELEC or even the Supreme Court? Third, on the residency requirement, whether she satisfied the residency requirement of the Constitution, and finally, whether the COMELEC abused the discretion when it imposed additional qualifications to the mem uh, qualifications of a member of the House of Representatives as enumerated in the Constitution. So in her view, requiring her to satisfy 9225 amends the Constitution. Because the Constitution doesn't say anything about the procedure in 9225, therefore, she doesn't have to follow those. Supreme Court's ruling, she loses. Comelec retains jurisdiction for the following reasons. He said that the HR 80, rather, the court says that the HR 80 doesn't assume jurisdiction over the case unless a petition is actually filed. So even if there is a proclamation that she won, the case has to be initiated at the house. And secondly, the court says, and the jurisdiction of HR 80 begins only after the candidate is considered a member of the House of Representatives, according to what the Constitution says. So what does the Constitution say? I didn't time this, I'm going, I want us to have some time in the end for questions, so we can always go back if there's a, you know, a part that's confusing. And according to the Supreme Court, citing its case in Vincent's Chateau, um, and look at, the language, look at the language they use here, the court has invariably held that once a winning candidate has been proclaimed, taken his oath and assumed office, as a member of the House of Representatives, the COMELEC's jurisdiction over election contests relating to, relating to his election returns and qualifications ends. So it's not a single requirement. The proclamation alone is not enough to vest jurisdiction uh, with the HRET. That's what I said. So you have all these three, you must satisfy these three requirements. Valid proclamation, proper oath and assumption of office. There's a logic to what the court said here. Uh, Reyes cannot be considered a member of the House because she has not yet assumed office. When the court decided this case, Congress has not started its new session yet, which begins at noon on the 30th, 30th day of June, following the next election. Okay. Until such time, the COMELEC retains jurisdiction. Uh, what about that oath that she took before the speaker, right? And she's trying to say that that satisfies the second requirement because she has already taken her oath. 
But the Supreme Court, the majority disagreed. And it says, I think they're citing the, the rules of the House and says that uh, under Section 6, the oath has to be taken before the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, and here, there's no indication it was made during the plenary or in open session. So it's not just any oath. It has to be uh, well, uh, before the Speaker in open session. And there's no showing that this oath was taken under those circumstances. What about the additional requirements under 9225? The Supreme Court said the Comele wasn't adding requirements, but simply implementing what the Constitution requires. Because one has to be a natural born citizen. So if one loses or reacquires citizenship somewhere else, then they have to show that they have reacquired Filipino citizenship. That's the only thing 9225 requires. That's what I said. And if you don't want to practice too much because you end up getting ahead of yourselves. Um, there it is. That's what the Constitution requires. As such, Comelec did not err when it inquired into the compliance by petition or section 3 and 5 of 9225. Comelec has to make sure that this person has reacquired Filipino citizenship. I think in our cases, the court said that if one loses Filipino citizenship, a natural born person loses citizenship, and reacquires it, one is still natural born, right? Remember that? Yes. And here's the response that we get from Congress. I think Rufus Rodriguez is a, a, our graduate. I, he's, I think he's ours, no? But he was a dean of San Beda. Uh, and then, and, and look at the, the way they respond. It's unprecedented. It's ridiculous. We don't say that. I mean, not in public. I might have said it a couple of times, right? But, um, <laughs> but these guys are saying it to the media to be, to, to be recorded. And uh, so what is he saying? They're saying that the oaths that they took before the plenary session are all valid. And when the Supreme Court says that, no, no, see, that's not the oath that the Constitution means. The oath has to be an open session. And they're saying, uh, wait a minute, you know, if the, the, these oaths are taken what, before the President of the Republic of the Philippines, they should be, they should be valid. And some, uh, and some of your, your representatives do take their oaths way before the, the, the first day of the, their terms, right? They do. And his conclusion is, it violates, the Supreme Court violated the Constitution and its own previous decisions on these matters. Wow, strong words. This is crazy. And it is. How can one question the oath administered by the president? There's, their argument is, it, is, it should satisfy the constitutional requirement for what an oath, what an oath means. Rodriguez said, and it runs counter to previous Supreme Court decisions which held that the HRET acquires jurisdiction over elected House members' election cases once they were proclaimed. And then it violates uh, the Constitution, which provides that HRET has exclusive original jurisdiction over such cases. I, for one, will insist on the Constitution and jurisprudence, up to a certain point. Not, not, the, latest, uh, not the latest case. And Senator uh, Angara said, the oath has to be valid. If it is taken before the 30th of June, because they, you know, they... Uh, the term of office begins in June 30. And he's saying that the new Congress convenes on July 22. And in the meantime, what are they? I'm not convinced about this problem, but that's what I think he's saying. If um, Congress convenes on July 22, and they, they, their term of office begins in the 30th, then shouldn't they be performing as members of the House already? But if you void that, if you want to, to wait for the, 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 uh, the plenary like the open session, oath taking, then in the meantime, they don't know what they are. That's, the, that's what he's saying. Hey, not satisfied with that, not satisfied with maligning the Supreme Court decision, they, officially, they recognized Reyes, invited her to attend the opening of Congress. They put up her picture. Her name is there, not Velasco's. 
Okay, so the defiance goes beyond just criticizing the Supreme Court. They take it further and say, um, and then she takes her oath again. Invited to the sauna. I'm trying to figure out what the logic is behind this. Maybe we'll, we'll find an answer later. And it's Reyes's picture, which was included in the gallery of lawmakers mounted, mounted outside the plenary hall. Then Reyes withdraws her case in the Supreme Court. She's saying, hey, look, guys, I'm already the member of the House. You have lost jurisdiction to emphasize the point, right? And withdraws her case so that the court cannot uh, reiterate its uh, ruling or, or say that she is a member, she's not qualified to be the mem or a member of Congress. And that's exactly what she's arguing. She's officially and formally, re formally recognized as a duly elected representative of the said congressional district. And then she voted for Belmonte. Are you following it? Then she says she's decided she's going to impeach Velasco. Why not? She's, they've done everything else. Um, not just the, Velasco, but the members of the Comelec who, this, uh, who, who voted against her. And Reyes accused uh, Justice Velasco of sparking a constitutional crisis. But see, I'm trying to show here the kind of language that, uh, that, that Reyes and her camps using against the Supreme Court, directly addressing Velasco. I, mean, I think it's in the next slide. It was used part of the constitutional crisis because instead of upholding the supremacy of the Constitution in Reyes, uh, undermined it and made a mockery of the Constitution. This is clearly the impeachable offense of culpable violation of the Constitution. Goodness. I'm not sure I can do that. And that's me already. <laughs> but, but look at this. This is another press conference that she said. And she's really addressing Justice Velasco. Remember, of course, he, uh, he, he didn't participate in the, in the case because his son was the rival. But she's actually challenging this guy. Look at this. It can be here in the House of Congress before the Committee on Justice on the hearing for his impeachment. If he wants, it can be in the public plaza in Marinduque, or right here in Batasan Road or Padre Faura at his option. From a co-equal branches of government, I do not recall anyone from, from any branch of government talking like that. Not in public. You know, in the U.S., remember, we had those stories about uh, President Jackson disagreeing with the U.S. Supreme Court and said, well, you know, the Supreme Court has made its decision. Let's see them enforce that decision. But they don't say that in public and say, I can, I, you know, this is not a, she's picking a fight. I call on Presbyterio Velasco, Justice Velasco, I think, to cease and desist from destroying our court as an important institution dedicated to the defense of the Constitution. His role as a member of the court is to interpret and not to rewrite the Constitution. And they were mad at us? <laughs> Wouldn't that be like a, the, the, the bigger, you know, if you want to go after, the court wants to go after somebody, go after her. Uh, Velasco, on his part, criticized Reyes for allegedly making responsible and ethical malicious statements in a bid to reverse the Supreme Court decision. Velasco described Reyes' move as a desperate attempt to influence the high court. In other news, Velasco wasn't, hasn't been sitting down. He's been writing the Speaker of the House saying, uh, Your Honor, you should be recognizing me because according to the Supreme Court, I won. But Belmont is ignoring him. He's not responding to any of Velasco's uh, um, letters. This one is by the columnist Rina Jimenez David, also blaming the Supreme Court. Seems to be a constitutional crisis of its own making. By voting to uphold a ruling of the Comelec, annulling the proclamation of Reyes, the Supreme Court has placed itself and the poll body in a direct confrontation with the House of Representatives. This is the, the tenor of the public commentary that followed the, the promulgation of Reyes versus 
Komelek. And she goes on to say, you know, what's going to happen now? There's a crisis and then we're going to, she says, look out if the justices will be able to set aside their collegial feelings. In other words, implying that the court has decided the case of Reyes because Velasco is one of their colleagues. Or can they rise to the occasion and actually be an independent, an independent court? And that's, that's uh, uh, Jimenez, who's going to blink. She's correct in the sense that now we do have this stalemate, a, a, a potential battle between the two branches of government. And you know, just by looking at, the, um, uh, at, at that short history of the case, and we're lucky it just happened, um, these are like some of the things that I, I, I think is coming out. The, the, the Supreme Court is getting the raw end of the, the, you know, the publicity. It seems, because it is not an active uh, body, uh, one, it usually is subjected to this sort of criticism, but not to this extent. And two, I don't know what Professor Tay is waiting for. Normally, they, they could have issued a statement, but they're not doing it, so there's something going on there. And, but my thing is this, my, 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 my main opinion is that the, the Supreme Court is correct in the, sen in the sense that if, for whatever reason, if one disagrees with the ruling in Komele, your legal remedy is not to do whatever, the, all those things that I just described to, to you. Your legal remedy first would be to file a motion for reconsideration. If you truly believe that you are correct, file a motion for reconsideration, point out all the flaws that you saw, and then have the court decide the case calmly, not, after, not by calling them names. Reyes did file a motion for recon until the House recognized her, and that's when she withdrew her case. So it's no longer clear, this is not no longer a, 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 a legal battle, it's become, it's become political. This is not the first time that the House has uh, uh, defied the Supreme Court, or at least a part of the House. During the impeachment of the Ombudsman, Mercedita Gonzalez, uh, Gutierrez, Gonzalez, Gutierrez, uh, there was a time when the uh, Supreme Court was about to issue a uh, temporary restraining order, and the Justice Committee said, we are not going to follow the TRO of the Supreme Court because we have exclusive power to initiate petitions, uh, uh, impeachment cases against the Ombudsman. A lot of saber rattling, a lot of, you know, posturing by, by members of Congress. And that's not too long ago, that's the 2010. And Marquez, his response was, his spokesperson of the Supreme Court said, as far as the court is concerned, the status quo on there has been has been issued, we all know the rule of law should be observed. He's correct, that's probably the only statement he's ever said that I agree with. <laughs> if, the, if the Supreme Court issues a TRO, if you disagree, you can criticize it, but you follow it. You don't say we're, not going, to, we're going to ignore this thing and go, to the, uh, and go on with the proceedings. And look at this guy, Rufus Rodriguez, same guy. He's the same person who said the Supreme Court's ruling in Reyes is crazy. Now, back then, said, you can't do this. You can't do this one. If we're going to define the Supreme Court, which is given the authority to accept and cite petitions, and that we have a, then we have a constitution, but no constitutionalism. If we define the Supreme Court, we have destroyed the rule of law in this country. That's the most important thing. Again, he's right. But the fact that it is the same person now who is calling the Supreme Court decision names is one of the reasons why I'm looking at this case like what is different? Why would the same person, and he's normally on the right side of things, uh, of every legal issue, because he sided with us about that whole plagiarism case, you know. <laughs> so I like him. <laughs> but, um, but it's the same person who says, if we start defining the Supreme Court, then we're going to define the rule of law. See, constitutionalism is is, is uh, made up of two parts when all the commentaries will tell you this. One is accountability. The other one is the rule of law. Okay? You can all have a constitution the same way. There's so many countries, almost everyone has a constitution whether it's written or not. But constitutionalism means that your country 
uh, makes public officials accountable and that there is a rule of law. That's why when he says, we won't have constitutionalism if we start defying the Supreme Court. And after all that talk by the Justice Committee regarding the potential uh, restraint on uh, the impeachment, they followed the Supreme Court. Belmonte said that too. Why are we going to fight them? You know, let's all calm down, let the court do its job. And in the end, they got rid of the, the ombudsman, right? Because she resigned. Now, legally, where is my angst coming from? Legally, it's from the cases that I make you read. I cannot, in other words, I cannot look at the, the story and, and, and not think about the stuff that I learned in law school. And from, the, from Marcos versus Manglapus, we're told first that there are three branches of government, each with a separate function. Correct? Judicial power is vested in the Supreme Court. These provisions not only establish a separation of powers by actual division, but also confer plenary, legislative, executive, and judicial powers. You know what that means from the cases? That means when the Constitution gives the Supreme Court the judiciary, plenary powers, it means all judicial functions go to the Supreme Court. All executive functions go to the President, etc., etc. Each department of government should be sovereign and supreme in the performance of its duties within its own sphere. Each department should be left to interpret and apply within the constitutional powers conferred upon it without interference, what may be termed its political duties. For one department to assume, to interpret, or to apply, or to attempt to indicate how such political duties should be performed would be an unwarranted, gross, and palpable violation of the duties which were intended by the creation of the separate and distinct departments of the government. We separate them and then we let them perform their functions by themselves without interference from everyone, without interference from another branch, except to, of course, to the extent that they may check on the performance of another branch of government. But this is the design of the Constitution. And this is, my well, citation is in the next slide. There. Oh, this is indentia, because we memorize our cases, right? I mean, just by reading it, you know, hey, that's indentia. <laughs> we have already said that the legislature under our form of government is assigned a task and not the power to make and enact laws, I, but not to interpret them, but not to interpret them. Now, I'm bringing all these basic concepts out here because that's what you should be thinking as students of law, not just as law students, but, you know, as students of law who want to understand how the system of government works. The, uh, Congress doesn't interpret the law which is, I think, what is happening here. They are the ones who are saying, no, this is what the Constitution means. And remember in, in uh, the taxation of the justices, the Supreme Court, the one point said, you do not tell us what the Constitution means. You cannot enact a law to say what the Constitution means because that is our job. Uh, and that, that is why we, we recall it. And there it is, Indenture versus the bill. Way back in 1955, a final court determination of a case based on a judicial interpretation of the law or the Constitution may be undermined or even annulled by a subsequent uh, and different interpretation of the law order by the legislative department. That's, that would be neither wise nor desirable besides being clearly violative of the fundamental principles of our constitutional system of government. Okay? You cannot do that, Congress, because it is our job to say what the Constitution means. Indre Laureta. No other department or agency may pass upon its judgments or declare them unjust upon controlling any decisible reasons of public policy and sound practice. You can disagree, but our decision is the law. Our decision is the law. <coughs> I just had to put in Angara versus the uh, Electoral Commission. Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. And when they do this, it is not to say that they are superior to the other branches, but they are only following their constitutional duty to say what the law is. See? That is the, the legal landscape upon which I am basing my reaction to this case. And when they do have to annul an election, this is more of an exception. It has to, it's a power that is exercised very delicately, not, not wantonly. As long as there is a legal basis, of course you can reverse the election. No, it's, it's okay. 
This is how judicial review is supposed to be, ideally. This is the U.S. Supreme Court telling the, the administration of George W. Bush that the EPA should be, I think, regulating carbon emissions. Now, the U.S. government, of course, you know the Republicans, don't think they should be regulating anything else. Uh, but then the issue went to the Supreme Court, and you do not have to like it. But that is how the system works. So you can do your job grudgingly, you know, but it's still the way the system works. Which is not to say, of course, that you cannot criticize the Supreme Court. Of course you can, but you do your job. Even Bush does it. This is why, I mean, of course you can criticize the Supreme Court. When they up the, uh, strike down a gun ban in DC, that's how, you know, that's how you depict it. So I love political cartoons. And they can do that in the US. And, and I think if I wrote this, I'd probably get into trouble again. And that is the burning question in my head. Why do people like, normally calm people like Rufus Rodriguez say it's ridiculous, and not only that, refuse to follow what the Supreme Court says? I think, it's, um, I think it has a lot to do with what happened. Ah, the picture didn't show. Well, there's a missing slide. It has to do first with the impeachment. I think. I think when we successfully impeached Corona in last year, it may have had a bigger effect on our psyche than I initially imagined. Now, I'm not suggesting it was wrong. I was so happy it happened. Um, but I think instead, I, instead of putting all the branches of government on a single level, I think it may have demoted the court in the eyes of the public to a level that is lower than the other branches, which makes it easy for members of Congress now to call it names. You understand what I'm saying? I, uh, I don't think, I, I didn't want that. I did have the opinion that they may have been losing, well, they may have been uh, overreaching many times. But the impeachment, I remember Justice Puno saying this, and I didn't believe him then. He said that the, the judiciary is demoralized and they're confused. And I was thinking, but they're grown men and women, right? They know what to do. They know that the, the impeachment is part of the checks and balances, that this sort of thing can happen. But I think we dislodged them a little more than we ought to have. Plus, the, this little thing with the flag ceremony doesn't help. In other words, what happened after the, after the impeachment and how the court seems to be bickering over certain things reduces the court in our eyes. So it is not now okay to go to the press and say, to, a, to point to a justice and say, I'm challenging you, whatever venue you want. That is unheard of until now. But I think there's a, a confluence of factors here that uh, the, the Supreme Court has to override, or else it is going to start sliding down and nobody is going to take it seriously. If you're the Supreme Court and you hear that kind of thing, you, you hear uh, members of Congress throwing tomatoes at you, figuratively, you, you cannot take it as an institution. But I think they're not standing, because they're not sure they're not sure how they are perceived in the public. They're certainly, they're certainly not the same court that, uh, that they were even during, even during Corona's time. And you know, Carpio says, I love this guy too. I have a lot of respect for him. But here he says, you know, it's not because just the Chief Justice is out of the country. It's the last flag raising ceremony of the year. So they all go there. Oh, damn it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and that's, uh, and, and, and interestingly enough, it came out, this came out in the editorial of the Manila Standard. It is looking at the PDAF controversy as an opportunity for the court to reassert itself, uh, I guess, against the other branches of government. Because now, the other branches of government are, 
are embroiled in this problem and they are not looking too hot either in the public's eye. And now we're all looking at the Supreme Court. And maybe this, in this way, if they do it the, the right way, then they, perhaps they can recover whatever they lost, whatever esteem they lost, and then they can be elevated again in the eyes of the, the public. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> but then, uh, I said it, all of this already, right? But the court cannot, I think, I think every time it, it dips in popularity, it's when it tries to ignore what the law says and then tries to decide cases based on politics. Now, we've read enough cases by the, by the Marcos Supreme Court. And we've read, we can see back then how, how anything can be legally possible. Now, we fixed that with the Constitution after we deposed Mr. Marcos. Then Mrs. Arroyo comes in with her own set of legal issues. And we see a Supreme Court that can justify any legal argument, even if it violates, in my view, and in my view, uh, common sense. Now, if the court wants to regain the prestige it had before 1973, then it has to start doing things again the way it used to. You got to have the, the, the more intelligent justices or people appointed to the court and then actually decide cases in accordance with what the law says, not to please the powers that be, not to please the, the appointing power. The second thing I asked you to read for constitutional law was this chapter from Peter Irons' book. Remember? Remember? <laughs> no. no, you don't, but it's okay. That's why I put it back here again. It, um, it talks about Brown versus uh, Board of Education and how during oral arguments, uh, the, the, um, the state of Arkansas would actually had the temerity to argue that, you know, we're not sure if Brown versus Board of Education is law in Arkansas. And you should say that, and, and, and the, the Chief Justice says that. I have never heard anyone make that kind of an argument in any court, and I'm, I'm old enough, you know. I've, I've handled so many cases. But when we make a ruling, and if you know the Constitution, that means that our ruling forms part of the law of the land. I think the court can do that only if it has moral ascendancy. If in the eyes of the public, it is not captured by any political interests. So when Justice Warren explodes, and puts that lawyer in his place, that is part of the prestige that we do not have. It has to regain command and say, that's wrong, and then everyone should follow. But the fact is, it doesn't have that sort of thing anymore. It's interesting because, for, 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 especially for your, your batch, when you came in, the case is already different. Two years ago, it would have been pro, even in a basic course like constitutional law and legal method, it would have been mostly pro Aquino, a very strong court. That's what, that's what you would see in the media. That was what you would read in your cases. Right now, it's not. It's, it's a kind of, well, placid, for lack of a better term. I love that last line. Former California governor, now wore a black robe, would not tolerate this challenge to his authority. And I think if, for us to say that the legal system works, that the rule of law exists in this country, they have to be able to, to act in that way. To say, you're wrong, I am the Supreme Court, do as I say. There should never be any doubt that everyone will follow you, even if they disagree. Even if they disagree with your ruling. That's the sign that the system works. I disagreed a lot with many Supreme Court decisions. You know that, you've read my work. And if you read even more of it, you would know, if you read all my work, you would think, my God, the Supreme Court has never decided a correct decision, ever. But I've never said, do not follow the court. Never, I think, I have to check. <laughs> but, in the, but, but legally, see, I do not understand um, what, the, what uh, the Reyes camp is thinking, because ultimately, this case goes back to the Supreme Court. I do not understand why, unless they were thinking that once you occupy a position, it would be harder to remove the uh, Reyes. 99, uh, occupation is 99% of the law in this case, I guess. Because ultimately the case can, we should go back to the Supreme Court 
on many ways. Let us assume the HRAT starts hearings on this case. Velasco, being a party, right, can challenge the jurisdiction of the HRET. HRET will say, no, we have jurisdiction. Velasco can bring that decision to the Supreme Court and say abuse of discretion by HRET. It, will, it has to go back. Even if they make a ruling on the merits and they say we have jurisdiction and we find that Reyes is qualified to be a member of the House of Representatives because she satisfies the requirements of the Constitution, Velasquez can bring that question back to the Supreme Court and say abuse of discretion and there is no way there is no way this case cannot go back to the Supreme Court and that's when the, the opportunity I think for the court uh, will arise I think if even if there was undue haste in the decision of Reyes if the case goes back to the Supreme Court and then they make a ruling um, make a ruling on the merits, a very well-reasoned decision, there is no way, there's nothing else for the, for the House to do but to follow it. I think that's why initially when we talked about this in class, my instinct was, and I, I blurted this out and I'm trying to research, uh, remember why I said it, I think the, the House doesn't want it to go back to the Supreme Court because in the end, if the court makes a final decision on this case, they would have no choice but to follow what the court says. Or else, they would be guilty of triggering a constitutional crisis. But I don't see how legally they can prevent it from going back. The HRET, the case in, before the HRET is pending. That means they, it has to be resolved. And because it has to be resolved, a decision has to come from the HRET, which will be vulnerable to judicial review if Velasco argues that there's abuse of discretion. So even on a tactical plane, you know, from a tactical point of view, I don't, I don't see it. There are missing slides here. I don't know what happened. There's a question, of course, in the press as to how Velasco, Velasco can be impeached, just as Velasco can be impeached when he refused to participate in the case. And then the, the, the lawyer for Reyes, uh, one professor, Harry Roque, said that, is he here? <laughs> He's not here? Okay. Uh, he said that it's clear from Justice Brion's dissent that the Supreme Court rushed the, the, the decision to favor Justice Velasco's son. I've read the dissent, I don't see that. I don't see that. I see two points made by Justice Brion in his dissent that are probably significant. One is that uh, they could have waited for, or they could have asked all the parties to, to file their uh, position papers, which it didn't. And two, that the court's ruling in, um, it, it's enough that there should be a pronouncement, uh, a proclamation of the winner for jurisdiction to be removed from the Comelec and to go to HRET. But it's a dissent. But I do not see a basis for impeaching uh, Justice Velasquez in the, on the dissent. So knowing Professor Roque, uh, it's more, it's, it's probably meant to intimidate. It's more, it's not really, you know, a serious legal strategy, I think. Huh? I, I, I may have to talk to him about it, but I just don't see how it's going to work. He recused himself. And then you're going to prove that, no, but you used your influence to get the majority to side with your son. Good luck with that one. I don't see how that's going to work. No, did I do anything? Yes, see, in either case, it will go back to the Supreme Court. Unless the court says, well, political events have overtaken this case and we don't think we should decide it again. But if the court does that, then it will bury itself even more compared to the other branches of government. And then no one will respect it. They have no choice. They have to, this is the case. This is the case where they have to stand up and say, uh, remember us, equal branch of government? <laughs> this, is the way, this is the one that, 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 that they can do it in. Sign its count. Ah, that is. Um, yeah, the, court, the Supreme Court's job is not to beat the house. It's not to say, hey, we're better than you. 
it has to explain its role the way it did in Angara versus Electoral Commission and say, look, this is not about judicial supremacy. We're following what the Constitution says, and our job is to interpret what the law says. And this is when you need great justices. Okay? Great justices are few and far between. Their job, I think, is to illuminate the issue, enlighten the public, and move the country forward. If you ever become a justice, can you, can you put that in your office so you remember what it, your function is? And, and now, if you're going to think into politics and say, and, 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 and have, you know, fisticuffs with the, the House, it will lose for many reasons, right? The budget, impeachment, there is no way they can win if they have a brawl with Congress. So you need an enlightened decision to follow this one. And I think, and I think if it does that, then the House will have no choice but to bow. And if that happens, I will have faith that we are on our way to restoring the, the, the balance of power in government. Right now, it's not. And I kind of feel bad for the court. I've never seen it in a position like this. I'm sure we called on Justice Del Castillo to resign. Sure. But we didn't call him names. We just pointed out the fact that uh, he might have lifted some passages. <laughs> but that compared to the language that Reyes is using, I wouldn't have signed that one. I wouldn't have gone along with that one. But the fact that you can talk to a justice like that now, and even if it's Velasco, who's really not the most popular one, shows there's something going on here. More than the legal aspects. All right, that's it. So, take your time for questions before you run off to your next class. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ultimately, the goal should be the rule of law. Once we lose that one, then there's no point in government. That even if you disagree with an institution so much, our ultimate job is to make sure they all do their jobs correctly. We don't call for the abolition of Congress, right? I mean, some people are, but I don't think they're serious. What we want is Congress to tell us how exactly the money is being used. Not for them to say, well, you're useless institution, we should just cut you out from government and have just a court and the executive. Of course not. Questions? It's okay if you don't. Uh, reminder though, I, I emailed every class Beatle president about further instructions on, on your thoughts on this activity. So there's, there, there, it should be in the mail. You got mail. Questions? Maybe? Shy? Not you? <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> the hot one. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, joining the Faculty of Economics soon. And she wants to know how we do things here. So if there are no questions, that's fine with me. You can email me private, PM me privately. Uh, and uh, I guess, um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Question daw dito yung isang taga-Congress. <laughs> she works for Congresswoman Kakabag Ao. Hindi na joke lang po. May question na po ask. No, I, I have a serious question about um, oath-taking. Do they really have to take an oath before the uh, the Speaker of the House or they can to, uh, take their oath before anyone? Plus, when did she took her, take her oath? Kasi... Kailan ba naging Supreme, uh, kailan naging uh, Speaker of the House, si Belmonte? Th that was during the SONA. So if she took her oath before the SONA, he wasn't even the Speaker of the House. Kaya, well, I think 
the practice is for people to have their oaths actually before Congress starts. Now, if we analyze the law, I think the majority is correct. This sounds funny. Um, because the Constitution does say it has to be an open session. And that means we have to have an elected... Uh, oh, wait a minute. But he was speaker before, right? Yeah, but does that mean that just because he was a speaker of the previous uh, Congress, he's still a speaker until another speaker... This is actually the first pronouncement we have on when the oath can be administered. Now, if the court is correct, um, it all has to be done by a duly elected speaker. Correct? Now, I know most of members of Congress take their oaths way before that. But I'm not sure Angara's conclusion that there is a, a limbo, a legal limbo, is, is valid either. I think what it probably means is, what the Constitution probably means is, when Congress starts, everybody takes their oath, and everybody becomes a member on that day. I think that is what the majority is saying. That on that day, when they select their leaders, I think the Constitution says that, right? And, and that should be the way it is. And there's nothing wrong if you start preparing to take your office in the House before taking an oath. But officially, it has to be an open session before, uh, uh, before the as a speaker who should be duly elected. And you're right, that should be the speaker of this Congress. Otherwise, the oath doesn't make any sense. So I'm not sure the, uh, so I think, I think Rodriguez and everyone's vicious comments about that might not be, uh, have a basis either. Other questions? So, but she can ask this now so that we don't have to talk about it later in the car. <laughs> uh, hi, sir. Good morning. Uh, two questions. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, sir, the rule that uh, the oath must be taken before an open session came from the House rules. And um, isn't it part of jurisprudence that uh, the court uh, may actually ignore House rules? Uh, if it violates the Constitution, yes. But in this case, sir, how, how would you see? I, I, I think the court decided to interpret the Constitution and it wouldn't matter then what the House rules mean. If the House will say we can take our oath uh, uh, shortly after the elections, as long as you're the clear winner, it's still, it still won't be valid if it contradicts the Constitution. Um, and then uh, last question, sir. Uh, the, the Supreme, well, sir, in theory, the courts are a non-political entity, or they should be a non-political entity. But doesn't the situation now paint them as a political department needing say, political capital to actually, <clears throat> like you said, sir, now they're on the fight to actually uh, reclaim their moral ground. Uh, now it must uh, actually, again, try to regain political capital, etc. Uh, are they political? Uh, oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes. And, and I think I, I've made that clear already that in th that's correct. In theory, they are not. But there's, there's the reason why we talk about Constitutional law cases is not is because of the politics. That's 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 not even an issue anymore. Okay. Thank you, sir. I see I see something there in the question. If I'm asking them to do the right thing, wouldn't that mean they should rise above the politics? And that's the I yes, that's the irony of it all. I think they should. I think it is because they embroil themselves in in politics. That they that they are they become vulnerable to criticism and, and attacks like this. I'm thinking though, maybe Velasco's camp is also wrong because they had to rush. Let's assume the the dissenters are correct that it was in fact rushed. What would be so wrong if they had taken their time and made a decision? Ah, I see. Oh made a decision uh, as, uh, as calmly as the dissenters suggested. People were saying, yes, sir, but they're trying to beat the deadline because if they don't make a ruling quickly, Reyes, the case would go to the HRET. And then the, the HRET would vote in favor of Reyes. But as I said earlier, 
it will always go back to the Supreme Court. So maybe the right thing for them to, have, to, to do in the first place was to say, as Justice Brion said, you know, we, can have, we could have had a full-blown uh, discussion of the case, ask the other parties to file a memorandum, and if they had lost jurisdiction, it wouldn't be the end of the world even if, even if uh, Reyes was truly disqualified. Because if HRET rules in the case and says, no, no, see, Reyes is actually a Filipino citizen, therefore she's a member of Marin Duque, uh, the representative of Marin Duque, that would not preclude Velasco from bringing the case back to the Supreme Court and allege that there was grave abuse of discretion on the part of the HRET. So maybe because they were still playing politics, they, they, they created the... Uh, the, this mess, like uh, Jimenez was suggesting in her in her column. So when you become a justice, then this, I think this is what I was saying. Then decide the case correctly, not because you want a certain person to win, or because you want to control jurisdiction. Take your time, do it right, because you will always get the last word in. Imagine if they had decided the case. They had uh, so Reyes brings the case to the Supreme Court. They ask Velasco for his side of the story. They even have oral arguments just to make it more interesting. And then they rule in favor of Velasco. Or, or, uh, yeah, or if the case goes to the HRET and then it rules in favor of Reyes, it goes back. And they can still have that, that, that long process of deliberation that will remove any kind of suspicion uh, away, away from them. Uh, from them, then there would be no problem, I think. I think what's fueling the, 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 the comments here, the really nasty comments, is the perception that it was rushed precisely to be the deadline uh, for, for Congress. And I'm thinking, if they had, you know, I'm, I'm going over and over again, but that's the, that's the point. It will always go back to them. More questions? Uh, good morning, sir. Um, regarding the, uh, the contention that the case will always go back to the SC, isn't it possible, given the confrontative stance taken by Congress, that the HRET might delay deciding on the case so that it would effectively grant the, effectively grant the position to, Re uh, to Reyes? Uh, yeah. But it, it still will get there. Uh, imagine the HRET delaying the case until the term ends. Yes, sir. But I cannot do anything about that. <laughs> I, I can't. But uh, you know, the process has to be followed. If, they, if, the court, if the House wants to play politics, let it, but not, the, but not the court. I'm trying to figure out why I'm buzzing it. It's the other one. I can't, we can't do anything about that if we want to play politics. But the, my response is the court can, should never initiate the politics. Cannot win, it cannot win. Yes, Recalde. <laughs> Mr. Recalde volunteered to discuss all the cases <laughs> in constitutional law last night. And he almost did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> he did okay. Um, sir, I would just like to ask a, a question. Actually, it's more of a hypothetical question. Because we have all this talk about um, election, uh, election laws and how jurisdiction, uh, uh, jurisdiction is lost or acquired by certain uh, the HRED, the SC, or the COMELEC. Sir, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be better functionally? Uh, since uh, you said, sir, whatever happens, uh, in the end, the Supreme, it will all boil down to the Supreme Court. Wouldn't it be better to streamline legislation so as to vest the final arbitration already to the Supreme Court. And in that sense, sir, wouldn't it be better to have it also have a time limit in which they could decide these electoral process mandated by law? Because um, from, from what I'm seeing in our current politics, sir, unlike, uh, in, in, for example, in the United States, sir, in, back in 2000, when there was, uh, when there was a, a contention between the presidential election of George W. Bush and Al Gore, um, the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court made all its efforts to have a decision 
before the oath taking of the President of the United States in January uh, because the elections were made in November the previous year. And in, here in our political spectrum, I don't see that kind of haste with regard to the Supreme Court. Sometimes it takes even, for example, uh, in the cases of some senators, their terms are for um, years and years. And sometimes they decide the case like only two years, two years left with regard to the term of the senator. So, sir, um, um, I'd just like to ask your opinion, sir. Would, would, would it be better if it was uh, mandated by our legislation or by constitution um, for the Supreme Court to have a time limit in which to decide cases of electoral protests? Ah, I see. Uh, you mean a mandatory one as opposed to a directory? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> because uh, the reason why we make it directory is because in practical terms, it really is impossible to tell whether we can resolve it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're suggesting that we put a mandatory period, an absolute mandatory period, such that failure to abide by the uh, follow that, that deadline would be a ground for impeachment? Yes, sir. Then <laughs> theoretically, yes, the system would be better. So why hasn't anyone proposed it, sir? I don't know. <laughs> In fact, if you ask me, I don't even sure. I'm not even sure creating, as, as you seem to be implying, creating the H red and the the set. It's a good idea, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, we, we bring in justices. They decide the case. I, I, why not just have the Commonwealth decide all the cases? Could be. Sir. That's one way to do it. But we're, not, you know, that's the system that we have now. Is it the best one? Apparently not, from our experience. And and uh, when we amend the constitution again that probably will be one of the, the flashpoints. I, right now, I know what you're saying. Right now, every system I can think of is probably better than the one we have now. <laughs> right? Yes, sir. Yes. And, and, and we'll see. Next, we'll see. OK, sir, thank you. Anyone else? Who are you? Uh, sir, La Pinter. Oh, right, right, sorry. Yeah. She's not dressed then. <laughs> sorry, sir. <laughs> uh, sir, I was just wondering uh, whether it was possible that if the Supreme Court stands its ground when the case finally goes back to them, might the public not construe that as, instead of um, reclaiming their moral ground, uh, they actually, it yes. might backfire because the public might think they're standing their ground in siding with the son of their... Colleague. Yeah, that's correct. That's a, that's a touchy one. I think we're not all, I think, I think uh, when the Supreme Court makes a bad decision, we tend to, we, t we all, all tend to agree that it's a bad one. It's like the League of Cities cases, uh, again, I think everybody's suggesting that that's politics. There's politics behind that. That's the reason why we recognize those 16 or 17 new cities. What I'm saying is, also, in the way that they do it, that's why I said in the end, it has to be in an Angara-esque fashion. But I think we can, the justice says, when they're pulling our legs, cannot hide it. Eh? That's, that's when I, uh, I have one of those outbursts in, in class, when I think it's, it doesn't make any sense. They can always do this in a way that makes sense. And if they do it that way, nobody will object. I mean, sure, people will grumble, like the, the picture of Bush, but he will do his job. You understand? Yes. And, and beating a deadline to, to retain jurisdiction is not the way to do it. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's why, you see, before 73, I don't recall any decision that sparked outrage on the part of the public. That's why the, courts, the, the Supreme Court was held in very high regard by the public in general. We can go back to those days, of course we can, but they have to stop playing politics. If you make me a justice, I'll show you how it can be done. <laughs> more, <laughs> that's not the bad part. I'm just half kidding about that one. Anymore? It can be done. I think if you're thinking in your heads that everybody is human, and everybody plays politics, then please don't aspire to be a judge. If that makes you weak, eh? Thank you. Okay, don't aspire to be a judge if you think everyone is vulnerable to temptation. 
Because you don't need ordinary humans to be there, especially the Supreme Court. You need to be superhuman. They can, in other words, immune to temptation. If you have that, then by all means. If you're, it can be, you can be swayed by public opinion or by money, then don't, don't my God, just, I don't know. Be a mime. Be, I don't know. <laughs> be, be an artist, but not, not a judge. Anymore? Yes. Can the Supreme Court instead uh, try to assert their authority by holding the members of Congress who, who, who's trying to defy their order in Reyes in contempt of court, sir? If the court held in contempt... Uh, can the they members... hold them in contempt of court by defying their order in Reyes, sir? No, I, I think that will make things worse. Like, even if theoretically you can justify it, that's the kind of brawling that I was try suggesting that the court avoid. You don't, you don't want them to say, oh, you want to defy my order? I'm citing you for contempt. That's why it has, to, it has to rise above the policy to say, you see, this is what the law says. And then that way, people become reasonable and they, will read, they, may, they may actually read the opinion and see whether it has merit or not. Thank you, sir. Any more? I know I said usually they serve food afterwards, but I'm not sure. So maybe that's what you're waiting for. <laughs> and now I feel bad. No more? You can go. Thank you again. Thank you.